Welcome to The Heal Podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan-Gores, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. Hey guys, before I get into this week's episode, I wanted to talk briefly about the ads. Just so you know, I only approve advertising by companies that we are aligned with. I not only try all the products and would organically recommend them, but I make sure we at Heal align with the ethos and the conscious mission of the companies as well. On top of that, all profits from the ads go directly into our Heal Helping Hands Fund, which offers scholarships and financial support to people who need it on their healing journeys. If you want to find out how you can contribute or apply for a scholarship, go to healdocumentary.com slash helping hands and be sure to sign up for our newsletter. Now, on today's episode of the Heal Podcast, I interview Marcus and Amber Capone. Marcus is a Navy SEAL who graduated from SEAL training one month after the attacks on 9-11. Like many military families, the Capones adapted to the high operational tempo of combat deployments and wartime training cycles, sometimes keeping Marcus away for 300 days per year. After 13 years and seven combat tours, it was the transition away from the SEAL teams that would prove to be their greatest challenge yet. After years of escalating hardships, misdiagnoses, and failed avenues of healing, Amber threw one final desperate Hail Mary and arranged for Marcus to undergo a plant medicine experience outside of the U.S. That journey is what Amber and Marcus attribute to saving his life and their family. Marcus immediately felt a deep call to pay his healing forward to his former teammates, which led to the formation of VETS in 2019. A 501c3 organization, VETS provides resources, research, and advocacy for U.S. veterans seeking healing through psychedelic-assisted therapy alternatives. It's fitting that this episode drops on 11-11, or Veterans Day in the U.S. My father flew in Vietnam, and my brother is an F-16 pilot who is still active in the Air Force today. Our veterans need all the love, support, and gratitude we can give them. And while the current conventional model for veteran healing seems to be failing, I'm so grateful that people like the Capones and organizations like Vets are helping to provide life-saving alternatives for these brave men and women who have protected our precious freedoms that even today are still being threatened in overt and subtle ways. Let's dive in. Marcus and Amber, it's so good to see you again. Thanks for coming on the Heal Podcast. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, it's great I, to be I, back. Thank you. Um, so I I don't remember when I interviewed la- you last, but uh, it was a couple of years ago, maybe two or three years ago. Was I pregnant at the time? No, it was just about a year ago, maybe a year, just over a year. Okay. It's been a long year. <laughs> Is that true? It's been a time war. Um, but honestly, like your story, Marcus and Amber, because Amber, you're obviously a huge part of Marcus's story, um, is really just one of my favorites. And I, I'm so excited to share it with everybody today. Um, and it's such an important one. So I think the best way to start off is if you guys can give the background, because what was so impactful about the first time I interviewed is, is you gave this whole, you know, kind of like the, the initial love story and then Marcus's journey into uh, becoming a Navy SEAL and then, you know, the kind of shift and, and what you guys had to, to deal with together. So can you just give us the background of like how you guys met and, and, and lead into your military background. Yeah, we'll hit the high points um, for the sake of time, but we've been together for over half of our lives. I met Marcus when I was 17 and um, my dad had recruited him to play football uh, at the local university. And so immediately I, well, Local for me, I grew up there. It's a Division one school. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the fighting Illini, right? No, it was it was Southern Illinois, but it was still. Okay. It was okay. Still That's a big local, yeah, local to Amber because she lives yeah, you know, I, in I, town over. I live there. I grew up there. <laughs> um, anyway, I saw him and met him, and I was absolutely smitten. He was one of the most charismatic, easygoing, lovable guys I'd ever met, and it was like no one else existed. Um, So fast forward a few years later, when we were both in college, um, Marcus decided to 
join the Navy and try to become a Navy SEAL. And that to me was so foreign and 9-11 hadn't happened. And I just thought, I don't want to spend my life um, married to the military. And so we had decided to break up. Shortly thereafter, I found out that I was pregnant with our son. And so that really changed the trajectory of both of our lives. And um, we just figured it out. We got married, the baby was born and um, Marcus went to Bud's. Yeah, so, our, which is our, seal training. our baby was Caden, who's 21 years old now. Yeah, <laughs> six foot three. Oh my God, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so then you went to Bud's, what is Bud's? I mean, I know what it is. I have two friends that I grew up with that are Navy SEALs and you've gotta be brilliant, strong mentally, emotionally, and you know, get super intelligent um, cause you gotta make, you know, life, yeah. uh, life or death decisions under duress. And um, so you're pretty much a badass. Explain what Buds is like. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know how I got past the, the brilliant part, um, but <laughs> I somehow I somehow made it. Um, yeah, my senior year of college, uh, I, you know, I was not, not that I was lost, but I was trying to figure out what to do for the rest of my life at you know 21 years old. And I had always been part of a team. And the the Still teams were calling. I saw some specials on Discovery Channel and GI Jane. And, uh, you know, I thought, wow, this sounds pretty cool. You know, best of the best, um, something different, um, you know, work with amazing individuals. And so as um, soon as uh, I graduated from college, we had our son, uh, we got married. Um, we did everything really quickly. And uh, I enlisted in the Navy. And so Bud's is basic underwater demolition seal training uh it's an old name uh, but it's your basic seal selection course for anyone that wants to become a navy seal and so um i did that for um it was about a year including six months of yeah, buds and six, you know, six months, of months of sqt and um ended up in the seal teams i spent 13 years there and uh separated in 2013 and, and stepped off into the private sector one of the things that threw us for a loop was that 9-11 happened the month before he graduated SEAL training. And so in such a short amount of time, we'd gone from being college students to married couple with a baby and now 9-11 happened. And so we were not prepared for the next in a series of years, but we had to quickly adapt. Wow. So 9-11 happened. You were a you know, new initiate. And how quickly did they send you overseas? Yeah. So I was a student. Um, we were actually, uh, we trained a few hours away from San Diego. And I remember the instructors uh, telling us that uh, planes had hit the World Trade Center. And we didn't, we thought it was part of the, we thought we were still in training and they, here they are again, just screwing with our minds. Um, we really did think it was a joke. And we said, man, you know, we're almost done with training. Why are they still, you know, why are they still playing these games with us? But, you know, to our not, you know, obviously fast forward, we know what happened. They actually took us in to uh, watch a 30 second news clip. And then we were back out and we were training again because we were right in the middle of doing push ups and sit ups and pull ups and we were doing a workout. And so they didn't really give us much time. Uh, we didn't really know what was going to happen. The instructors, we can tell there's definitely a different demeanor because, you know, most of those instructors have been in for 10 or 15 or 20 years. They knew what they were about to get into. We had no idea. We just wanted to get through buds. And um, yeah, it was, it was, you know, it was wild. And then once that, I guess, kind of, um, I don't want to say it, it didn't die down, obviously, but uh, we went back to training. We graduated a few weeks later. And I went to a SEAL team on the East Coast, SEAL Team 10, uh, with a number of individuals, and half my class stayed on the West Coast. And um, we didn't deploy for, I'd say, a year and a half, or two, two years. Uh, a year and a half, two years. Um, you deployed in 2002. 2002. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> a year. I did. Yeah. All right, so it was a year. <laughs> Amber's like, I remember very clearly. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. <laughs> she remembers better than I do. So, but yeah, so I was overseas in a year and then I was in Afghanistan two years after that. And, uh, you know, from then on did multiple combat deployments to both Afghanistan. And then when we went into Iraq, um, we did a deployment to Iraq and, uh, yeah, it was, a uh, it was a quite a, uh, fast paced time in the military, you know, for yeah. individuals that served from nine 11 up through now. 
Yeah. So it was about 12 years ish that you were kind of active, like over there fighting. Right? Yeah. Just under, just under 10 years total, like, um, actively deployed and training, um, back and forth. And then my last three years I spent as an instructor, I was a first phase buds instructor, putting students through, you know, selection. And then, uh, I ran, um, advanced training for two years. So. Wow. Uh, tell us a little about your role and kind of what, you know, just the intensity that, I, or I guess like the trajectory of, you know, because you chose to be a SEAL. I remember so specifically because we talk about, I really wanted to put um, and cover a veteran healing story in, in, in the film Heal. And I just never aligned with the right person. Um, but I think your stories are so important to tell and your, you know, veterans need so much support and, and alternative methods of healing now than the, than the conventional model that just kind of assesses them and throws them on a bunch of medications. Um, so kind of, so I basically, I remember you told me, I, you know, I didn't suffer from PTSD. I fully chose to go in there. Like, sure. you know, like it's, you know, I, I was excited to go into battle and I, you know, I was built for this basically. So I wasn't traumatized by it, but um, kind of tell me your trajectory of, of duty over those 10, 13 years and, and where it kind of started shifting for you. Yeah. I mean, just like you said, you know, I still have trouble with the, you know, post-traumatic stress, um, diagnosis because I, I just think there's still a lot that we don't know. And, you know, it used to be called shell shock. It's the same thing, right? But shell shock was really guys got their heads pounded and they call it shell shock. We're finding out what we're dealing with. You call it post-traumatic stress. I think the majority of us that have had mild traumatic brain injuries from like these little sub concussive blows, whether it's from throwing grenades or demolition or, you know, shooting a, a rifle over and over again for many years. Um, that's, that's shell shock, which is now mild traumatic brain injury, which is causing PTSD, which is causing depression and anxiety and, you know, just all these things. And, you know, I was Superman for the first number of years until, you know, I, I think, you know, somewhere 2008, 9, 10, where I feel like I plateaued in 2010, it was just not a good time. And it felt like, uh, you know, my brain was racing all over the place, figuring out, you know, what do I do? This is not the same anymore. I don't, I'm not looking at this job, starting to feel like a job. Um, you know, our family was completely disconnected. Um, we just needed something. And so we thought, okay, let's, let's just really almost like run away, you know, we'll run away from everything and everything will be okay. And, and, you know, it just got worse from there. Um, and again, I don't know what to attribute it to, 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 you know, playing tackle football, I remember getting my bell rung at seven years old from a 10 year old, you know, who's like twice the size of me. Um, that's like the hardest hit I can remember from my earliest days. And from then on, you know, you went all the way through college, you know, so maybe that has something to do with it. And then I served in the military. Of course, that has something to do with it. And he was a breacher. You know, I was a breacher in the military. So I, you know, I did play with a lot of explosives for a couple of years. Um, so maybe that had something to do with it. <laughs> and then the transition is tough it's, uh, it, it, it could drive you nuts. Um, you know, and I, you know, luckily and, and, and blessed, I have, you know, two graduate degrees. I always had a, an amazing private sector, quote unquote, job or started my own company. And, you know, economically we've done well, but that doesn't matter. You know, I don't care if you gave me a million dollars, like I was still bad. I was still in a bad place and, and no amount of money could equal the fact that there was something wrong. You know, and that's why we're talking to you here today. And that's why we're on this path that we've chosen. So it seems like, you know, obviously we're seeing in hockey and football, this whole CT phenomenon that's coming to light and suicide and depression and aggression and, and all of these things are, are symptoms, side effects, expressions of CTE. Is mild traumatic brain injury the same as CTE? Is it like, it seems like more of a physiological issue than a psychological issue, this whole PTSD kind of massive depressive disorder, et cetera. That was my observation was that he was diagnosed solely with a psychological condition. And in my mind, it didn't make sense because 
um, I knew that he loved his job and he loved deploying and he would go back and he really didn't to me seem traumatized, but he definitely seemed cognitively challenged. He seemed unlike himself, his personality had changed. He was experiencing um, bouts of impulsivity and uh, rage and you know it was just very unlike him, uh, complete opposite of who I met in college. And so for the longest time, I thought, you know, this is, the doctors are right. This is PTSD. The pharmaceuticals will help. They really didn't. And every year it was getting worse. And so um, there was a brain autopsy that was released in the SEAL community. And that was the first time that I'd heard anything about blast injury. Um, I also know of a couple of autopsies that have shown uh, at some stage of CTE in veterans as well, uh, friends of ours that have, have been diagnosed with that post-mortem. It's not a diagnosis that is available in the living, unfortunately, but for someone with the history and the symptoms, uh, it's difficult not to assume the worst. And so it felt very much like a terminal type diagnosis. It felt hopeless whenever I realized that this isn't a psychological condition solely. It probably has a physiological component as well. And um, we were just desperately trying to find answers available inside the US. Of course, military medicine and the VA, uh, the, the go-to mechanisms are pharmaceuticals and talk therapy, neither of which were effective for Marcus. And so I thought, well, maybe brain clinics will help. And while they provided a lot of um, great di diagnostics, not really a lot of follow-up or solutions. And so by the time he'd done five over the course of about two years, he was really becoming very frustrated and very hopeless. Uh, and I knew that time was of the essence. So basically like at the 10 year mark, when your job started changing, it's, it could be, it could be, you know, it could be a combination of just high amounts of stress for a long time. It finally depletes your system. It, it's combined with the physiological effects of mild traumatic or seemingly not so mild <laughs> traumatic brain injury because you were getting hit by 10 year olds when you were seven. And then, you know, you're a breacher and it's like exposed to blast uh, concussions all the time. Um, so you started Amber, he came home and he was a different person essentially, right? Yeah. And over the course of years, as these changes are happening slowly, you don't realize it. It's only when you think back to the person that you met, the person that you married, do you realize how far you've progressed in not, not a great direction. And so um, I was very worried and I started doing a lot of research. So back to your question about how um, blast injury is similar to CTE or TBI, um, that's still a relatively new phenomenon, and it's being found in very large numbers in the uh, brains of veterans post-mortem. So it's thought to be very similar, yet different than a degenerative brain disease like CTE, um, which is also, and it's, there still needs to be a lot of research to fully understand CTE, but it's thought that over time, as these concussive and subconcussive blows to the head occur, whether it be from contact sports or blasts, um, it can create a degeneration in the brain over time. And as that happens, these other symptoms come into play, um, which you know, range from depression to mood issues, impulsivity, insomnia, hormone imbalance, hormone imbalance. <clears throat> and all of those things together just make this toxic combination veterans by and large are diagnosed as having PTSD if they've seen combat. It's just like this, this rubber stamp diagnosis. They don't really do that with NFL players. They're definitely bringing TBI much more to the forefront, but we're up against a fight of misdiagnosis in the veteran community because uh, no amount of talk therapy or pharmaceuticals will combat a degenerative brain disease. Yeah. A physical disease that obviously is then going to affect it cause an imbalance and then neurotransmitter release. I mean, our brain is our best pharmacy, right? And so if, if the physical hardware is damaged, it's going to, you know, release some wonky chemistry that could lead and look like PTSD. Um, so before we get into this beautiful solution that um, you found, Amber, you know, the wives are kind of the unsung heroes um, and you've been a champion of his of Marcus's healing journey because of the love you have for him. And, but I'd like you to just kind of share how difficult the whole journey was um, and how, you know, just you 
you noticed a change in your husband, um, you know, personality and existence and, and, and mood and, and how that affected you and the family and, and, and what you did to try and, and help bring your husband back. I think there are so many, um, just to start with a veteran, this is the first time in American history that someone could have served an entire 20 year career during a time of war. And so for the generation that adapted, um, you know, right at 9-11, like Marcus's um, buds class, for example, he still has, his buds roommate is still serving today, still deploying wow. today, 20 years later. Um, the spouses who have held it together during this unprecedented two decades of combat are still having to hold it together now. We're seeing a lot of struggle with the veterans themselves, which is to be expected. You know, society is kind of just, yeah, veterans struggle and <clears throat> that's to be expected. What really gets overlooked is the struggle of the, the spouse and children. And, you know, they're still trying to hold together, still trying to find solutions, being trying to you know, do whatever they can to help their veteran. Um, that's where I was with Marcus. And I knew that I was exhausting all efforts available to me and we were running out of time. I felt like he was running out of time, um, that we very well could lose him to suicide. I also felt like I was running out of time as a mother um, in what I was willing to subject my children to. And so mm -hmm. I never wanted to leave him. I never wanted to give up on him, but I felt like I was coming to a place where I had no choice. And, um, the brain clinics, you know, when we decided to take a pivot from military medicine, the brain clinics and kind of going this semi alternative Western route with, you know, hyperbaric oxygen or, magnetic brain stimulation, I felt like, well, this is all I've got. And uh, he went to five of those types of clinics or treatments, and he was probably more unhinged at the end than he'd been to date. And I just thought, I can't do this anymore. Um, so I, I was kind of coming to terms with the fact that I was going to leave him, and that probably meant that he would not be around for much longer. And you know, how do you grapple with that? You think you're protecting your kids on one hand, but on the other hand, you could be subjecting them to a lifetime without their father. It was just, it was a lot for me. Mm -hmm. And I remembered um, a, a friend who had done an alternative plant medicine treatment outside of the US and reported that, you know, saved his life. It changed his life dramatically. And so this thought popped into my mind and I thought, well, two things. One, it could really work and that would be amazing. I didn't have a lot of hope left at that point, but I was hopeful. Um, but two, if it didn't work, then I will know that I have tried everything and this would go a long way in forgiving myself if the worst happened. Um, so it was very much outside of my comfort zone. I didn't know a lot about it, but I trusted the other seal who was guiding us uh, and sharing his experience. I approached Marcus with it. Um, after really two years of leaning into my own healing journey, I was able to see him through different eyes. I was able to approach him in a completely different way. And that resonated with him because we were both exhausted, yet we somehow found a way to come back together on this path. And he went to, he went out of the U.S. and uh, did a psychedelic assisted plant medicine treatment. Okay. So uh, thank you for that setup because again, this like the way you tell this transformation story is just stuck with me for forever. Um, so Marcus, why don't you kind of go into what that plant medicine psychedelic was in what the setting was and, and your experience and, and, uh, going through it. Yeah. Um, you know, just as Amber mentioned, it, it was more frustrating, uh, every, you know, modality that you, you, go to because you you hear that you're going to be better when you come out of this place and you know as amber mentioned it, it was just more frustrating that i wasn't getting better and you know, thank goodness we went to you know one of the top brain clinics in the world and they actually did um take a bunch of imaging and it showed that i had some you know structural damage to the brain which on one hand it was great to know on the other hand it was really depressing is saying hey you know you, you may have some real issues going forward and so that was a little I don't want to say frustrating, but at least I was, you know, I understood that, okay, there's something here and, and maybe there's something we can do to, to make it better. Um, or at least we know potentially this is what's causing some of the problems. Um, <clears throat> I had, when I first heard about psychedelic therapy, you know, my initial reaction was that 
that didn't make any sense to me, right? Because I, I had been taking SSRIs, multiple SSRIs and other pills along with that um, for years that the first on active duty, I was first prescribed my, my first antidepressant until 2017, basically the weekend I went through treatment. And so here I am being told that I'm going to take another medicine to get better. And so that didn't make sense to me. <clears throat> and then a psychedelic didn't make sense because I heard, you know, all we you know, learned about growing up was a war on drugs and brains, you know, uh, this is your brain on drugs. And you see the little egg in the, in the frying pan. <laughs> and um, so we had that stigma. And, you know, psychedelics, come on, you know, people dancing in an open field at Woodstock, you know, <laughs> in hair, and this is just nuts. Um, I was like a Long Island kid who played sports and went to old boys Catholic school in Queens, right? Uh, to me, this was crazy. So it took about a year and I did my own research. I did a lot of reading. There was a lot of um, information to back it up for originally these medicines were intended for for um, for mental health use. And they were just taken as and used as recreational drugs like a lot of people do. They take, you know, again, not us, but, you know, there's millions of people out there that use prescribed drugs for their, you know, recreational life. And so that's what happened with psychedelics. Uh, the government didn't like that. They scheduled them as schedule one uh, medicines, which means they have highly addictive. Not medicine, schedule one substances. Well, substances, but they are medicines. <laughs> they are. Uh, not heroin. Well, not heroin. They're, they're, that's the crazy <laughs> well, no, opioids, opioid is a medicine. You know, so anyway, anyway, we couldn't use them. We couldn't research them. And, you know, fast forward, now we're on this renaissance. And, you know, I thought I've tried everything else up until this point. So, you know, why not try something that at least everything I'm reading actually works? Um, I was very hesitant. You know, I was just tired of us fighting. I was tired of not having a relationship with the kids. And I was just tired in general of not being healed. And so I, you know, it took a leap of faith, um, worked with my, you know, my, my therapist, my, my psychedelic therapist, uh, who had just years and years of experience and, and she was a PhD and um, got me prepared for my journey because that is most important is going in there, setting intentions. What do you want to get out of this experience? You can't go in there with your mind all over the place because you may have a rough, a rough time and you also may not get out what you need. And so, you know, preparation and integration, we always, we always preach that. Um, and I, I, you know, I dove in and um, the, the journey was in, so anywhere from eight to 12 hours of, of misery for me <laughs> I experienced it's in pill form and you take it per your body weight. Um, Ibogaine was the, 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 uh, the plant medicine. Well, Ibogaine is actually um, uh, synthesized from the aboga plant or the aboga root. It, it grows in West Africa. Um, and it's been used in some of the, the indigenous cultures for years. And it's just, it, it, is a, it is a punch in the face, punch in the gut for hours. Um, but you, you, uh, you experience many of the traumas potentially that you uh, are affecting your everyday life that may have been maybe hidden in your subconscious. What the drug does is it pulls it to the forefront and you actually witness this. I mean, you're, you're actually in an awakened dream state. So you're, you're actually almost watching a, or you are watching a movie of your life flicker in front of you. And uh, some individuals, including myself, um, actually at some points of the experience, watch this like hard drive defrag so you almost see your life in files of pictures and you, you could like feel your brain because you could feel everything when you're on the drug um you literally can feel you know like they call it a body scan you could feel different parts of your body that may not be your blood not, might, may not be flowing correctly but you can actually feel everything you can feel the blood coming into your brain when you're on it um and, and so you can also feel your brain defrag and it, and when it defrags, it's like cleaning up a hard drive. You literally feel like you've just filtered out all the garbage, you know, and you just pulled all these weights that have been like, you know, leaning on your shoulders and you come out of there just light and fresh and energetic and happy, you know, and sad and emotional. 
because we, we, you know, these emotions were tucked away for so long and, and, um, you know, you're just able to love again and feel again and look at things differently. Like you could actually look at plants and trees and stuff and say, wow, look at that. It's green or the wind's blowing or the sun looks beautiful. And these are just things that never even, you know, crossed my mind before. And so it was just, it was just an amazing experience as horrible as, as the actual experience was. And it was very dark and demonic. And, you know, I obviously had a lot of, um, quote unquote, demons to, to, to deal with. Um, but once those all went away, it was just like, it was, it was magic. Amber and I, you know, we just said, we embraced, um, after the experience, you know, when I woke up, I slept for hours later because you're, you're, you know, you're wiped out, you're up all night. Um, but when I woke up and I saw Amber, I just said, like, this is incredible. Like, how do we share? How do we spread this word? It's just unbelievable. And, you know, that's, kind of the trend is that most individuals who come out of these experiences realize that they actually, they actually had so much suffering, whatever that meant. And now they're free and now they just want to help because you just, um, it's something special about, about the drug that you want to help others and you want to make, uh, you know, make the world a better place. And so it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty radical. Um, before I ask Amber about her experience, cause again, uh, I love that part of the story. Um, a lot of people that I, I speak to about psychedelics and I've done ayahuasca and mushrooms and other things, but it's, you know, these are plants that come from nature and yes, the ibogaine is actually synthesized and, and you did it in the clinical setting with the right kind of therapist and doctor to administer and make sure that you, uh, you know, prepared and integrated after, which is so important for a healing journey, you know, setting intentions, like you said. Um, but was there, what I find is these plant medicines that indigenous cultures have been using in the proper setting with the proper guidance of a shaman or a medicine person or whatever, um, they are portals to, you know, kind of reconnecting to not only ourselves, but the world around us, each other and nature. It's like a, a powerful dose of nature and a reconnection to source. Did you how, like, were you conscious of this connection that you felt? It was unbelievable, Kelly. Um, there's an experience I had that I watched a, um, I watched the nuclear bomb go off. And I mean this, like I watched the mushroom cloud in the distance, you know, like, why was I seeing that? And I remember just saying, holy shit, we did this. Like man did this. Like we, we did this to ourselves." Um, it was wild because I, I don't know why I was having that vision and I don't know why I was having those thoughts, but that was the first thought I had. I'm like, Oh, we, we developed that thing that just, you know, went boom. Um, and, and granted, um, what I did as a seal, I will never, um, like I, I would do it again. Like I, I loved that. Like I'm still me. Like I loved being, a, you know, a special operations soldier. I loved the individuals I worked with. I loved going overseas and, you know, protecting America against, you know, future attacks and, and taking terrorists off the street. Like, I love that part and I'll never, but, but I also now see another part, right? And like I said, you know, seeing the nuclear bomb go off in my experience was just wild. And the first thing I thought, I was like, man, and I said, man created that, like we did that, you know? And so you do have this insane connection with um, individuals and nature I don't know how to explain it. It's just one of those things that um, you feel, right? And is it because we're, we're really not solid individuals? We're made up of, you know, molecules and cells and everything else is too. And so I don't know, like that's, you know, that's, that's way above here. You know, you could talk to, you know, people like Alan Watts and individuals like that who, who are not around anymore, who probably are um, know a little bit more about that than I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's a beautiful, it's a beautiful shift in perception. You know, yeah. you, you love the elements of being on a team and competing and pushing yourselves and solving problems and protecting the vulnerable. Um, but you had this awareness, like we're full circle. We're all humanity. You know? Yeah. Well, Kelly, I mean, we, you know, for years, um, like I said, I'll, I'll still be a warrior in, 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 in my own right. Um, and Amber knows that. And, you know, warriors for years, though, when they defended their nation, city, town, whatever it was, they healed 
in between or after. So they fought and they came back and they healed, right? And they, they, they got better and they, they, they worked together as a community and, and, you know, they built and they, you know, they, they it was a creative element. grew food and they, yeah. And they just, they did things together, you know, and then, you know, and then the bad people come along and then they have to go back to war and defend, you know, their, their homeland again. And then they go back and heal. And I think that's where we, I think we got it wrong for a number of years is that um, we're just, we're just going too hard, you know, and, and um, some of us burn out early. And, you know, I always say I envy the ones that have done 20 and 30 years and have done three or four times more deployments than I have. You know, I wish, you know, I wish I can, uh, I could have kept, kept up with them, but, you know, I, I broke down. <laughs> but now you're in a healing phase and you and are I'm, bringing, bringing healing and this experience through your, your organization vets, you're bringing this healing phase that is missing in so many veterans lives um, because we've been in this constant state of war for the last 20 years. And, you know, obviously even before that, Vietnam, there was so many unresolved, uh, there was, there was no healing. There's no, there's no completion to the cycle. So it's just complete burnout and destruction of, of these people that we're fighting for our freedoms, you know? So you're yeah. bringing this awareness and element that is missing uh, to protect the people that are protecting us. And it's so beautiful. We did, we did fail our Vietnam vets and I feel terrible about that. And we are um, just our organization, you know, we are, there are veterans that are reaching out from Vietnam saying, hey, you know, we didn't get anything, you know? So we are helping, the, the problem is, um, most of those individuals are like in their mid, mid seventies. And so it's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, you know, we, they have to be really screened prior to, uh, you know, prior to any plant medicine journeys, but, you know, we did fail, I think as a country in taking care of those individuals, I think we've done a really good job. I think we've flipped that 180 and, and, you know, uh, nonprofits like ours, and there's hundreds out there that are doing amazing work, make sure that we don't do that again. So, yeah, amazing. Yeah. So back to Amber, uh, when I first interviewed you, you described the first moment you made contact after um, Marcus emerged from his journey. Um, can you describe that for us? Absolutely. Um, this time, four years ago, I was truly, I, I was just thinking, you know, please, please hold on. I was begging him to please hold on. And he went for treatment on Veterans Day of 2017. So we're approaching the four year anniversary. And when you put all your cards on the table like that, and you get to the day where you, you know, I dropped him off at the airport. And I thought, like, this is it. If this doesn't work, then I don't know where we go from here. And so seeing him for the first time was really, um, gut wrenching. I was just, I was so nervous uh, because I, I thought if it doesn't work and it's, he's no better, I'm going to be absolutely heartbroken. And um, I was very nervous to see him. He came down the hall. I could hear his footsteps. And when he came around the corner, it was really like being reunited with him for the first time ever. Uh, the first time that I met him, his whole demeanor was different. His um, personality was back his heaviness was lifted. He doesn't even know this, but um, the, our friends uh, had intercepted him from the airport, taken him to the clinic. And uh, the, the, the wife called me and <laughs> said, um, she said, Marcus's energy is so bad. I can't be in the same room with him. I don't know how you live with him. And all of that was gone in the next day. It was just, he was completely back to normal. And of course, like, you know, there have been bad days since. Some of his worst days have come since. Uh, our organization was born out of, you know, the, the want to pay this forward. And over the last four years, we've learned that, even and through our own experience as well, we've learned that it's not going to fix your problems. It's going to give you the opportunity to create the space to do the hard work. And um, the tough days that have come since have served a purpose in allowing Marcus to utilize new tools in getting himself out of a, a really dark place. So um, we've worked together as a couple. We've both worked individually. We're still working. It's like, you know, ups and downs, but generally trending upward. And um, our life is completely different today. Yeah, those down days are um, really short-lived now. And, and like Amber said, you know, we have, 
our daily practices and routines that you know we are unfortunately or fortunately going to have to do for the rest of our our lives. Um, you know, meditation is a huge part of my life now. Um, it's the first thing I do in the morning for you know thirty to forty minutes, and I try to do it for you know fifteen to twenty in the afternoon. But it's for me, it just wow. Talking about like just regulating everything, it, it's 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 I call it saving my life now because it's just it's so addicting and it's it feels so good. <laughs> by the way, by the way, you have like physical brain injury, which hopefully is healing and regenerating, as we know brains can now um, with all the work you've done. But like I say, meditation is saving me on a daily basis, and I haven't had trauma. Um, thank God, uh, you know, and I, you know, you're human and you just happen to have this like rich history of badassery. So you're <laughs> maybe your maybe your swings are slightly more extreme than mine, but I have really bad days where I lose my shit and yeah. I have to come back to my tools. So you're human and it is a process, but I think we're all healing, uh, relative to our own circumstances every day. And, and we have to have those tools to save, save ourselves every day, you know? Yes. Yes. Um, so, uh, I'm going to get into vets in a second, because this is, this is the, you know, again, you are going through, you went through the fire and, and you came back and now you're, you're a healer, basically you're helping others heal through your experience. And, um, what other, I know you guys help to offer grants and, and support for different psychedelics. There's, I think five or six of them. What, what all have you tried and, and what kind of has been your reader's digest uh, or two minute kind of experience with them? Uh, in terms of medicines? In terms of plant medicine. Yeah. Or yeah. I've, um, you know, I microdose regularly. I think it's, I, again, it's a, it's a game changer, you know, and I, I it's just puts you in a, it puts you in the right place. It, it helps you be creative. It, it, helps you focus, um, keeps your mood light. Um, you know, I've done, um, some ketamine therapies on some of the down days that Amber were talking about, you know, so I went to actual, you know, vetted ketamine clinics here in the U S, um, and went through their protocol. I think ketamine for suicidal ideation, you know, for treatment resistant depression is, I don't think there's anything better or quicker. Um, I have done, uh, psilocybin, you know, mushroom experience, um, have not done ayahuasca experience. Um, I am very interested because, you know, I hear so much good that comes from it and so much growth and, and learning. And that's what these are. Every, every time I, you know, go into these journeys for me, it's growth education. How do I get better? You know, um, how do we become more aware, more mindful? Um, what else? 5-MeO-DMT. We did, 5-MeO-DMT, thank you. So the, the, um, the protocol that many of the individuals are, are doing is an Ibogaine uh, treatment followed by roughly 48 hours later, a 5-MeO experience. And 5-MeO, if you know, comes from, they call it the toad, um, what is it, 5-methox, methoxy, methotryptamine. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. Um, anyway, it's, it's a, one of the most powerful psychedelics on the planet. It gets you from zero to a hundred and immediately, um, which could be a little scary, but it, it, it's very nice after Ibogaine, which has been really tough and rough and mean and dark. Um, 5-MeO kind of brings you to the light and, and it really just kind of opens your heart. And um, so it's a nice, what they call it, kind of a cherry on top. Um, mm -hmm. And also some people actually have similar experiences on 5-MeO that they had on Ibogaine. So some of them are talking to their dead buddies, you know, that they served mm. with overseas. So, you know, some people can go that, that way on 5-MeO, but for most people, it's a very enlightening, light um, experience uh, yeah. itself, so. DMT, right, it's 5-MeO DMT, is that what it is? DMT is, is, is a separate, it's a separate molecule. 5-MeO okay. is a different molecule. It's, okay. it's I, I kind of call it a step up because it definitely is a different journey. I think DMT is a little bit more like visual and colorful. 5-MeO is not. It's very white, white light, and you're, you're almost separated. It's pure ego death. Um, oh. You know, some people just like see themselves just kind of like melting into the earth and then just being in this like wonderment, you know, around them. So Beautiful. Yeah. Um, 
So that brings us to Vets. You have created this beautiful organization that raises money, offers grants to other veterans um, who are, well, explain to me what Vets is. Vets is our 501c3 organization that was born out of our own struggles and triumph and um, what really pushed us to come out of the shadows and get out of our comfort zone was the suicide of one of my closest friends' husbands. I thought, you know, this can happen to Chad. It can happen to anybody. We'd walk that path and we'd done it largely alone. There's such a stigma of speaking out and saying that you need help, whether you're active duty or you're a veteran in a very ego-driven community. Um, no one wants to raise their hand in vulnerability and it's, it, it, that will cost someone their life potentially. And so, um, we put together vets to uh, provide resources to get veterans out of the United States immediately so they have access to these life-saving treatments um, because they're not available in the United States. They're all schedule one right now with the exception of ketamine. Uh, MDMA will be available hopefully in 2023 and psilocybin around 2025, but the FDA process you know, takes forever and it's, it's millions upon millions of dollars and a lot of bureaucratic red tape. We found a way to circumvent all of that and create a three-pronged approach to um, ensure the highest likelihood of success both now and in the future. So we provide grants to veterans to leave the United States to seek these therapies, but we track their outcomes stateside in IRB backed research so that we can use the anecdotal, you know, very stories from very credible voices alongside the data to drive policy change. And we've started that. 2022 will be a really exciting year for policy change. We're working in a number of states. We're, we're um, starting work at the federal level as well. We were instrumental, I, I think, in passing a bill in Texas which pairs the Houston VA with Baylor College of Medicine using taxpayer funding to do a research, uh, to do a study on psilocybin assisted therapy for Texas veterans, which is a huge first step, especially in a state like Texas. Congrats. That's amazing. I mean, seriously, like you see all these veterans. I drive by the VA often in, in LA and in West LA and in Brentwood, and there's literally tent cities everywhere. So the homelessness problem, the suicide problem, all of this has been exacerbated by the year and a half we just all went through. But if you look at these veterans, a lot of people judge them from afar. Oh, they're drug addicts. Oh, they're alcoholics. They're dead. You know, it's they're they're seeking that connection that you know, dampening down of their trauma, they're seeking an escape. And if we can provide these beautiful tools from nature in the right setting with the right integration and preparation, you know, there's so much we can do. It's, it's just mind blowing to me that, that so much is suppressed in this country that actually works and is not harmful and, and we could change lives. And, and, and really we need to I'm so thankful that you guys are fighting at the policy level because that's what we need. We need to change the way that we um, treat veterans and pretty much all people. Our medical, <laughs> our medical institution is is backwards, and and obviously that is evident in how many people are sick today. So, um, and that's and that's why you that's why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing I'm doing my best, but that's I a good honor. Name. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, so much needs to be changed. And it's so amazing what you're doing. And I'm, I'm excited to contribute to your gala, um, which is coming up on 11-11, right? Yeah, it's our, our inaugural fundraising gala at the Hotel Del Coronado. And um, it's on Veterans Day, which ironically is the four-year anniversary of Marcus's successful treatment, which kicked off all of this. So it's a very fitting day and time to bring together those in support of our work and what we've really been most encouraged by. Um, what, one of the things aside from helping to change and save and impact lives is the unity that is created around these therapies um, from all walks of life, both sides of the political aisle. It doesn't matter what your background is, what your beliefs are. Uh, we've seen a real uniting around these therapies and around starting with the veteran voice to advocate for them and eventually, uh, hopefully, get, giving access to all Americans because, yeah, I mean, I think the whole world could benefit from this, but we got to start somewhere. So um, we're really excited about the gala. Amazing. And we're, this episode is dropping on 11.11 too. So we're just, we're really, uh, 
Excellent. Yeah. yeah. So um, where can people who are listening that know someone that could use your support or, or want to find out more to, to actually contribute themselves, where can people find you and Vets? Our website is vetsolutions.org. We're on all social media platforms as well. Um, the best place to start would be the website. We've developed a free e-course for veterans, which can be found on our website. We've got all of our most recent uh, news media and everything that we're doing listed right there. So um, yeah, probably visiting our website. And one more time, what does VET stand for? VET stands for Veterans Exploring Treatment Solutions. Amazing. Well, <laughs> perfect. Uh, well, I always love talking to you guys. Your story truly just is so powerful and, and so inspiring and, and you're bringing the healing back into the warrior. Um, archetype and, and story, which is so needed and missing in this country and, and abroad. So um, thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for sharing your story. And uh, I hope that I can hang with you guys soon. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. <laughs> All right. Thank you for listening to the Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in every Thursday for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. Oh, and make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And if you feel inspired, we would love you to rate and review us so that we have the opportunity to reach more people. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram for some behind the scenes fun and more inspiration at at Heal Documentary and at Kelly Gorris. Thank you so much and be well.